Again, thank you everyone for joining us. Our conversation today is very similar to conversations happening around the country across the industry, among growers, co-ops, state agencies, and everybody related to corn and soybean. Um, we're all talking about the storm and the aftermath of the storm. On August 11th, a very powerful storm swept through Iowa uh, with wind uh, gusts up to 140 miles per hour. It originated in Nebraska and South Dakota, and the storm quickly grew to severe status as it crossed into the western of, of Iowa. What happened in Iowa was massive, massive destruction across almost 14 million acre of planted corn and soybean, and the losses are, are in excess of $3 billion. And those are the first statistics that are coming out. I'm pretty sure we're gonna learn more and more, know in more details the damage in that assessment. Today, I'm joined to talk about the storm and the aftermath of the storm by Michael Morris. Michael is the district manager at Aravian. Um, he's based around Kansas City, and Michael serves customers in the affected area and have witnessed firsthand the destruction. Good morning, Michael, and thank you for joining us today. Good morning, Manal, and, and everyone on the webinar. Thank you for taking the time to be here this morning. I know it's bright and early. But what a great morning, at least uh, around Kansas City, to, to learn about this and, and really kind of understand what we can do using technology to help farmers move forward from this. Yes, we're, we're very keen, Michael, today to talk about a couple of stuff. Our agenda is to, uh, we want to talk about the damage assessment, how remote sensing and analytics could assist in assessing the damages and understanding their extent, their severity. Uh, we want to talk about how you can quantify that, what you can do with that information. Uh, we've got a couple examples from Iowa, uh, from the corn of, uh, in Iowa this year that we're going to run through and, and share the findings. And uh, I pulled up a couple examples also from extreme weather conditions from last year. You remember the excess rain, uh, a hail, storm, and some, and some other stuff. So we'll talk about some examples and how uh, the data can, can assist in a lot of decisions. And last but not least, we're gonna talk about what's next. Um, what's next from here? What are farmers considering? What are people talking about at this point uh, about harvest and insurance and nitrates and crop rotation and what's on everybody's mind? So I'll start with this slide. I've put together a few statistics that I found online uh, that, um, and, and they're becoming clearer by the day, you know, the damage is huge and um, uh, a couple of these statistics were published, one was published yesterday and a few last week. Um, according to the USDA, there's an estimate that indicates that 43% of Iowa 2020 corn and soybean crop has been damaged, 43%. That is devastating. Um, it's sad because, you know, corn was, was, was almost two weeks ahead of the previous year. And on average, we were five days ahead of the average, uh, the five-year average uh, on the corn. So it was looking like a great year. It was looking like, you know, 200 bushel per acre. It was looking like soybean was doing great. It was blooming, 97% of soybean was blooming before the storm, and 90% was setting pod, uh, which, which is also a week ahead of last year's soybeans condition. Unfortunately, the damage and the destruction uh, covered almost uh, 57 counties in Iowa. 57 counties were affected by the storm. And the USDA uh, put out this number saying that about 8 million acres of corn and 6 million acres of soybean in Iowa were completely destroyed. It's, it's very drastic and, and the impact and the destruction is quite big. Uh, what are you hearing, Michael, from your customers and from growers in the area? What, how have they been describing the situation? Let's well, start off with a lot of unknowns. A lot of them didn't even have power. Um, and even to this day, some still do not. Um, power companies were running out of supplies. Co-ops uh, were completely turned upside down. And, and so agronomy teams were, were trying to figure out, you know, how do we split our time? Where do we go first? How do we figure out um, you know, what the damage actually is versus just driving by it? It's, it's pretty obvious. I mean, when you can count the plants driving 70 miles an hour, um, in, in the field that's still standing, you know the devastation is pretty bad. And so some of those decisions were, were fairly simple. There was a lot of damage, though, so, um, on hillsides, there was some damage 
um, around uh, some windbreaks, things of that nature that you just, you really couldn't see. Um, and, and again, there were so many unknowns. Today, it's, it's more of, we kind of know what's happening. Again, imagery has helped that greatly with understanding not only the severity of the damage um, by using a couple of different layers that we provide our customers with, but also being able to measure out those areas and say, okay, we, you know, of this 100 acres, we have 80 of it that's, that's on the ground, 20 of it around the tree line is, is actually okay. But in these areas of complete openness, you know, 100% of it's on the ground. Wow, 100% on the ground. And everybody, you know, following the rule every five days, going back and checking to see which, if corn is gonna bounce back, if, if, if it's all just Correct. blown over and it's gonna, it's gonna come back again. Um, and, and there was a lot of tweets last week. I was, I was watching Twitter closely and seeing people posting pictures of like, very, very, scenes, scenes that are very painful to watch and, and corn that was looking great, looking, yes. I don't know. I don't know what the word to describe. Yeah, we've we've had conversations. I have personally with farmers that, um, you know, they've been farming uh, all their lives and they have never dissed under a crop. They have never seen destruction like this at the scale that it is. Um, everyone said, you know, I, I've had hailstorms, I've had wind events, nothing of this magnitude. Um, insurance companies are overwhelmed. The co-ops are overwhelmed. The farmers have no idea what to do. Um, really, say they didn't there for a solid week to ten days, honestly, after the event passed. Um, you know, what's my next step here? Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly where we think, uh, you know, both of our services and, and both of our knowledge would be helpful. And that's the knowledge that we want to share with our community today is how we could be of help and of service given we are where we are. Um, I want to talk about what's on everybody's mind, which is insurance adjusters. Um, everybody's trying to, you know, fill out the paperwork and, and find their local rep and, and look into how, how did the storm affect the field? What part of the field was the most affected? Because, you know, the, the common practice of planting hybrid varieties, which one was resilient, which one we can salvage. Uh, they will understand out of multiple fields which one was hit the most, uh, which area was hit the most, and also uh, a lot of questions and uh, that we are trying to help answer is being precise about identifying the size of the, the problem area, the severity, and then the persistence. The persistence is going to be highlighted and it's going to be demonstrated by, you know, keeping keeping our eyes, which is cameras and satellites and and and. Uh, remote sensing tools, keeping our eyes uh, on this for, for the coming couple of weeks to see the persistence of the damage and in case of any sort of comeback that will happen. We've got a couple examples we want to share with, uh, with our growers today. This example is coming from um, Iowa. These are two uh, fields planted by corn. Uh, what you see in front of you to the left and to the right are two fields, hybrid, multiple varieties are planted. And uh, what's showing up in blue is the area that's affected. This is a, a GIF that goes from before the storm, the 28th of July. Uh, those two images were captured by Taravian. And the second, uh, um, and one is on the 29th. And then the second image that you see, the image with the blue, is the image that is after the storm on the 11th and on the 16th of August. And you can see the damage. You can see uh, everything that is in blue is it was good corn and now it's pretty much ripped up, ripped up corn. Uh, you've been to those fields, Michael. Yes, yeah, and uh, in great examples here uh, for this wind event. The one on the right there um, is actually part of a very large trial. It's, it's got 20 some different varieties planted in kind of the southern two thirds of the field. In the first image, we can see everything looks really good. The varieties were handling everything um, really well. It was part of Iowa that's, that's had a little bit of drought, so we were seeing some stress there. After the wind event, um, in, this, in this next image, we can see a lot of that corn ended up going down. Um, but then you kind of go up to the northern, the northern part, and, and you can see a lot of it really you know, stood, stood the storm and, and did not have a lot of damage. Now, I'm... I'm hearing and, and seeing again on, on the latest flight which just came in actually a lot of that corn that was standing or, or was actually trying to make it through has, has since given up and fallen over um, and, and that's a common story I'm, I'm hearing that almost daily from from people in Iowa that said you know hey I, I had 40 50 percent of my field that went down the other part looked good um, it was still standing now we're actually seeing that crops start to stress out more 
um, from defoliation mainly, um, coupled with a, a drought situation, and those plants are just giving up. And so what they thought they had um, to at least try to harvest um, is, is becoming evident that they might not be able to take that next step as they thought they could. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And, and as, as you were saying, time will tell. Time will tell. And, and now we're, we're starting to see it's almost been 10, 10 good days after the, after the storm. Uh, and and time, is, time is the only judge to see if this, if this corn is going to count and bounce back. What I what I uh, what I want to share next is an is an example of being able to precisely add uh, and quantify um, the damage extent. This is the example that we were looking at previously. As you can see, this is a field. Uh, um, as, as we as we mentioned, uh, the hybrids were planted. You can see some uh, um, some particular rows were still standing or are are still not considered complete damage or, or they lost their structural uh, uh, um, um, uh, signatures. So, so the NDVI was, was still high on these. So I'm looking now at this field and as you can see, everything in blue is where the damage occurred. And for every damage, uh, there's a quantified size for it. You can see the damage ranges from um, areas that, are, that cover six acres and areas that cover 15 acres within that field. So what, what, what we're looking at is, is the capability to fly, to obtain imagery, um, and then assess the damage. Uh, run, run the crop stress analytics that is able to identify the location of the stress, identify the, uh, the extent of the stress, and the exact size of it as seen uh, as time progressed. So this is an image that is on the 16th of August. Uh, uh, there's a new image coming in today for that field that you guys flew in yesterday. So we're going to be looking at that. We're going to assess if that, if any of this is bouncing back uh, and is reflected in the imagery, or if not. So we're able to, uh, uh, so we're able to that, to see that uh, on the imagery, and we're able to identify and quantify the extent of the damage, the size of the damage. This kind of information is super helpful because you want to know what you want to report on. You want to know what you want to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. You want to know uh, what, how, how, what is left, if what is left is enough for you to take what action. And you also want to be able to report uh, that information on any claim so you objectively know uh, uh, the exact size of the damage that you're looking at. Um, this is another example, uh, same field. Uh, what I wanted to show here is I wanted to show you the NDVI curve. And um, this week I was, I was particularly, I went back to the literature and I was looking at and, and um, um, how NDVI is known to be a structural index. So it's, it's a score. It's a score that relates uh, the light that we capture in the near infrared and in the red. Uh, so it's a formula, it's a score that goes from zero to one. But this formula and this score is, is a structural index. So as you can see in the NDVI, uh, um, it dropped widely between before the storm and after the storm. Uh, you can see uh, there's multiple, uh, there's multiple uh, um, colored lines on this graph. Some of them are the destructed, totally identified as this is where a lot of the, this is where big destruction is. And you can see this, this, uh, this purple uh, uh, pin right here on this particular variety. What you can see uh, is NDVI is a little bit better and is higher uh, compared to, for example, the damage and the variety that is on this side that was planted, the hybrid that was planted on this side of the field. So when, this is a way for us also to demonstrate and to highlight uh, and to find uh, the varieties that were resilient compared to varieties varieties that were uh, um, totally did not stand to the amount of the wind and not complete damage at this point. Um, with the bless of remote sensing and the fact that there are multiple indices that we can build uh, on top of the NDVI, another index we could, we could build on top of the NDVI is called CCCI. Uh, this is a score that relates to how much uh, nitrogen uh, to how much chlorophyll precisely that is found in the leaf. Um, and you can see uh, uh, that the NDVI had a huge dip. The structural index had a huge dip because the structure of our corn totally went flat. 
uh, but at, at, right after the storm, it was still green uh, on on uh, on uh, the August of 18th. The corn was still green, so there was still still considered the chlorophyll. The plants were still trying to bounce back uh, um, and regulate what happened and try to get upright. But all of these indices help us paint the picture of which variety is resistant, which variety has survived, which variety uh, uh, stayed greener longer, um, and understand how the variation is across the field to decide what to do next. I mean, I'll, I'll just interject. That's that's a great point there. The the NDVI scale on on this variety uh, test plot is is really telling of, of what the crop did right after the storm versus today, nearly two weeks later. Um, and, and people in the south right now, uh, they're they're facing Hurricane Laura. You know, uh, obviously we don't know what varieties these exactly are, but we can start putting pieces together and say we know some of these varieties of corn is going to withstand these strong hurricane force winds in reality a little bit better than other varieties did. Um, some, like you said, will, will hang on to that chlorophyll a little bit longer. Some of them just purely green snapped. And so we're starting to see a, a lot of content of nitrate down towards that bottom of the stock and it, it just has nowhere to go. Um, and we're starting to pick that up on the infrared and, and the thermal layer that Travion provides its customers with and start putting those pieces together along with the, the tools and, and technology that you guys have there at Fluorescence and be able to, to make sense of the situation and know what's in the field um, that's, that's maybe harvestable. Um, obviously this field isn't quite so much that, but um, those fields that are still standing, how did they respond? Or the fields that simply just laid over, you know, they're, they're still trying to respond. They're still trying to take out the sunlight and, and go ahead and mature on out. And it's without having those tools, it's very difficult to do that on a large scale. Exactly. Uh, that's, that's so true. And I don't want to get into the weeds of, of how different bands are providing different information, but I do want to highlight, because you mentioned the near infrared, uh, when we capture light in the near infrared band, uh, uh, because the near infrared is, is so directly in proportion and, and it relates to the thickness of, of your leaf, to how it's lush and well irrigated and it's in good shape. Uh, because that, that dictates all the scattering that's going to happen inside that leaf, and that will dictate what number we're going to get out of NIR. And you could see, you could see how uh, uh, light captured in the red, in the near infrared, uh, and in other bands, we can use that information to, one, uh, identify and quantify the damage, know exactly where it is, how it stands, track it over time, see which varieties are persistent, and, uh, um, and, and monitor it. See if it's going to bounce back. All of that, using that science in this particular situation is, is, um, is very nice. Very nice to see it in handy. Uh, uh, the relation between how the plant is going to react and how uh, uh, and what you can do about it. Anything, this is the actionable information that we want to bring up. Um, I've got here a couple of examples from, from last year. Uh, similar cases, not to the extent of this year, of course. This is a, a green snap damage that was uh, uh, caused by um, a case of strong wind that caused the green snap. Um, as we know, there was, in, in that particular field, it was variable rate hybrid. Uh, so some will snap, some will not snap, some will be more resilient. Um, and what the imagery here that was captured uh, uh, by, uh, uh, between the satellite resolution and Travian resolution, we were able to identify and quantify the size of the damage and the extent of the damage and how it was growing within the field. Um, the this, this same information was used to uh, um, report on uh, insurance claim and this information was used as well to uh, um, help the grower decide what they need to do and, and, and which variety to plant and in this particular case, uh, how he was planning to harvest those, those areas. Um, green snap is common, obviously. There's a lot of examples. It, it comes back every year, but not to the extent of this year. Um, absolutely. Um, this is another example of another extreme weather. And, and indeed, it's the case of these extreme weathers where you go to technology and, and you look into finding those answers and you look into remote sensing and all the tools you can because of extreme conditions. Um, yeah, last year was also extreme conditions when it comes to, uh, to rainfall. This is a field in South uh, Center, Kansas. Um, they had a significant rainfall early in the season that delayed planting 
And once they had corn on the ground, another significant uh, uh, rain event happened. It almost rained eight inches in 28 hours. It was a lot of rain. Um, so imagery was captured by, by the Travian plane at that point, and uh, we ran the analytics of identifying exactly the areas of flood damage um, and identifying the extent of the damage. It was, it was a very good example of, of adding all, multiple pieces of data uh, between adding the, looking at the weather, looking at the image, uh, running uh, the analytics, choosing the right index that reflects what we want to quantify. And um, this all enabled uh, to quantify the impact of the rain event. And this was sent to farm service agents that turned them into uh, uh, their application when they were filing for event loss or crop loss events and subsidies uh, and, and financing uh, programs uh, to get back on their feet. The story of the weather continues uh, with other events uh, where remote sensing and and analytics came together to provide a, a helpful insight on either quantifying the problem uh, and helpful insight on how to move from there. This is a case of frost, uh, which is also very common in your, in your area as well, Michael. Uh, the it case is. of, uh, yeah, early on, um, on September 7th, uh, weather events, you could see it. Uh, it was highly reflected in the NDRE index, which is a score that relates and tells you more about uh, the chlorophyll and, and the terrazian. And um, we were able to identify the extent of, of the spread of that effect. And then later in the season, a couple of weeks after that, when harvest happened, we were able to uh, uh, look at the yield map and relate both maps. And you could see easily uh, the relation of this is the area that was affected by the frost and it was reflected in the yield map as well as area of, of low performance. One more weather event I want to talk about, and I know as well that you have a lot of experience on that as well, uh, Michael, would be the hail damage. Uh, you've seen that happening uh, earlier this year as well. We had a couple events in your area. Uh, this image is from last year, uh, um, along in June, July, when we had a huge event. Um, what I want to show here, these are imagery by Taravian that were captured, and then we run our analytics on it. And I want to direct your attention to the graph. As you can see this plateau here and this dip, this is where the whole hail event happened. Um, it went flat, then we lost uh, uh, the corn that was planted at that point. It got affected. And what we're hoping to see, still hoping to see, is uh, that would happen for this, this event as well, as you can see the bouncing back, the recovery after that hail event. The energy that was captured throughout the season demonstrated how <clears throat> corn, you can see those pins in all of these different locations, was able to bounce back. It flattened, it was affected uh, for almost from June 15 to, uh, um, to July, to the first week of July, and then it slowly bounced back and it went back to where it should be. Um, so we're, we're no strangers to damage uh, caused, caused by weather and the help and the, and, and the insight that imagery and analytics could provide uh, on that. Um, any, any comments you want to add to that, Michael, from your experience? Just that the, uh, the imagery really helps provide insight into uh, defoliation of those plants right after the hail event. And, and again, this histogram chart here is, is really telling um, that, that we didn't lose quite as many leaves as we thought maybe we did, or, or we did in fact lose those leaves, but the plant was still early on. It was able to put those leaves on, try to put those leaves back on or, or be able to use the leaves it had to, to really mature on out. Imagery is, is really crucial after an event, uh, but it's also very crucial after the event in, in the sense that not just a few days after the event actually occurred, but in the weeks coming to make sure that what we're doing to correct the issue that happened is actually the correct steps to be doing. We, we certainly don't want to be throwing our money away and, and try to save a crop that is honestly not savable. Yes, indeed. So we spoke about uh, the, the different varieties. I've got a question here. Uh, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, they're asking about, you know, how different hybrids, different susceptibility levels they have, some are resilient, some will fall. But the question is about the topography and the interaction effect 
between the topography and uh, the, 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 the blow of the wind within your field? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and a lot of that kind of circles back to the genetics that corn had. Um, as far as topography goes, you know, higher elevations, we were seeing a lot more damage uh, than some of the low-lying areas. Again, it goes back to, you know, tree lines, wind breaks, things of that nature in Iowa are becoming more and more um, obvious that, the, that they're needed to help break some of this wind up. And so just because you have a flat field does not necessarily mean you'll, you will sustain the most wind damage if you have a wind break. What we were seeing and, and are still seeing, um, the higher elevation corn, if it was wide open, uh, received the most damage. And we can then start to lay out um, our topography maps from as applied, um, whether it be planting, fertilizer, strip till, um, those types of things, and overlay that with some of the imagery and be able to put a nice, a nice piece of the puzzles together um, as best we can using technology that this part of the field is probably going to be worse than the others and we can start using past uh, yield maps um, along with some harvest data um, that's also calibrated at the same time and be able to start overlaying that information with the imagery and, and know maybe where we need to start putting our, our efforts into saving that crop at. Yeah. Yeah, and one more thing I want to add uh, uh, um, from what you mentioned, and something that I was reading is the fact that when you when you're applying or when you're using uh, when you when you're um, uh, filing for claims and damage and looking at how you can be assessed for the damage and what was the opportunity. Something else I want to add about the the, the importance and the beneficial of of the imagery is even if you look at the satellite level. I'm gonna go back a few slides just to show you. Um, just to show you what I'm talking about. So I'm referring to the fact that when, you, when, when you're trying to put out a claim um, and you're trying to assess of like, okay, what was, what was my yield heading to? How was, how was my field performing? Uh, what were my uh, growth stages before the storm? Um, and how was I trending? Was I in the right position? So looking retrospectively and analyzing those imagery, for example, which is everything that's happening from the beginning of the season, so before the storm, you were here. This, this was your status of, of your field. And you have that information for the different varieties are going to perform differently. So you're also able to, to uh, by using the imagery and by using the, the remote sensing uh, um, science, you're able to assess where were you. So, when, when, so you know, I was in that growth stage. I was trending upwards. Um, I, uh, you can also benchmark against your county, you can benchmark against uh, other fields, and you can say, this was my field before the storm, and this was the potential, uh, and everything looked like um, 180 it was uniform, 180 bushel gold. Um, so that's also another way, and I was, um, I, was, I was also thinking about that, how this could be super helpful when you're also trying to assess, um, uh, uh, when you're trying to claim a yield loss and when you're trying to claim uh, crop loss. Have you heard farmers talking about that at this point? A little bit, yeah. Um, it's a thought that's, that's really starting to, to get on everyone's mind now that we're a week or two into this event. Um, really, um, we're, we're seeing a lot of movement towards using the, the, the past imagery, like you say there, to, to know exactly what stage the crop was in. Um, thankfully, this year in Iowa, things were pretty well even um, across the area. That's not always the case. Um, I know in my part of Missouri up to just getting ready to tassel and, and so that's that's quite a spread um, it can be very difficult mm -hmm. to understand um, how to move forward from that so thankfully in, in this situation at least we were fairly even across the um, or dent and so we were pretty close there um, but yeah there's there's a, a lot of talk about you know making sure that the, the crop uh, in the past anyway um, was headed in the right direction and we're still being able to to treat that crop um, moving forward from the event from the stage it was at yes and there's a lot of topics on growers minds i want to get to i want to hear your thoughts and what you're hearing on the ground uh we put together this this list of what is uh, uh what is technically the what is on everybody's mind starting from the insurance adjusters filing for claims uh, getting a hold of your local uh, uh provider um, tell me, tell me more about what, what growers are sharing with yeah. 
I, I smile only because COVID has definitely not helped this situation. Um, insurance companies, though, have been really, really good um, given the situation that we have um, in, in getting the adjusters out to the field. They're pulling them from other regions of the country to make sure these farmers get the claims processed um, in, in a way that they need to, honestly. Um, and we're still seeing a lot of claims outstanding right now. Um, like I said before, farmers uh, um, they honestly still don't don't have power in some areas and so it's, it's becoming uh, a little bit easier uh, to get those claims filed um, by phone things of that nature uh, but, but there's a lot of concern still around getting those claims um, completed um, on time for the farmer to actually do something the the next step kind of after that claim is what on earth do I do with this mess um, you know we have a lot of biomass on the ground we have a lot of issues um, you know that's, that's starting to get on people's minds whether that be um, nitrate issues, whether it be nitrogen leaching, um, you know, it, it could even be, you know, how do I pick this crop up if I'm going to try to harvest it? Um, can I silage this? What disease, um, you know, problems am I going to start running into? Um, can I feed this? Am I going to have some toxins coming in? Um, and on that note, we're actually starting to see um, on this down corn, uh, a lot of mold starting uh, in the ears. And so the farmers that have waited for their claims to be processed, that's that, Hey, I'll come in and I'll silage this or I'll try to pick it up. Um, they're just now getting permission to go in and, and do something with that corn and, and they're finding that it's, it's full of mold. Um, and so then you start talking about toxins and things of that nature. Um, and so it's a different mindset from what they had just a week or two ago. Yeah, a lot, a lot is happening. And as we, as, as we said, like time will tell what would be the, the best way moving forward. And I heard, on my end, I heard a lot of people talking about, uh, as you mentioned, uh, um, salvaging everything up or putting uh, or getting live feedstock uh, to, to get into their farms, their fields, and, uh, and, uh, and munch on the, on, on the corn. Um, what you said also was key because there's a lot of worries about next year, volunteer corn, what's the rotation, what's the genetic, you know, every, it's, it's heading towards a bean year expected next year. Uh, so what varieties and what genetics would help compact uh, the volunteer corn um, and, and just help paint the picture of, and, and you know how it is in ag, it's always game over and, and start game uh, two minutes later. So uh, planning for how to salvage what we have, I think obviously, and, and it's, it, it came uh, with a lot of conversations I had this week. There was a lot of uh, focus on it's going to, you know, it might rain with, with the possible mold and the fungus and uh, um, some of that grain might not be marketable even if they go out and they harvest whatever they can harvest with different combined heads and different angles that they could salvage uh, because it won't pass the quality standards uh, to go into the food chain so there's a lot of concerns there's a lot of uh, um, a lot of ways this can go uh, but at this point, assessing where we are understanding and having uh, a good painted picture of what were you in the season before the damage? What happened after the damage? Um, monitoring your corn for the coming another every five days uh, with, with, the, with the imagery that's being captured and, and seeing, is, are you picking up any NDVI? Is your structure coming back to life? Um, are you losing more uh, from the scores that relate to your greenness and to your chlorophyll content? Is this corn heading to being rot and, and being done? Um, so just monitoring and using the tools that we discussed today um, would be super helpful to, to understand the picture on, on the scale that you want to see it. Um, there's actually a question that came in, a Michael for you. It's talking about the capture of the data. It said, um, I'll read it for you. How did the time work for the schedule slides and capturing the damage in near time or close to near time? Do you have a regular as needed aerial data capture uh, or what happened? Like he's wondering about those particular flights that they were lucky to have a before and an after. Right, so I'll, I'll start with kind of the, the basics. And so Travion uh, offers subscription programs and we make weekly attempts to capture those fields. And so the week before the, the wind event there on the 10th of August, uh, our planes were flying, we were capturing fields. We have a lot of fields that, that saw data coming through before that storm. Um, and then the weeks passed. 
Um, obviously, after the storm, we had a lot of clouds uh, and we, we had uh, some, some issues we had to work around as well. Um, just because of the storm itself, you know, power was knocked out. We, we can't process this data if we don't have power. And so um, it, it did take a day or two to get the planes up in the air and know that we would have actionable information coming back. Um, but it, within a day or two after that storm, we had planes in Iowa that were flying the storm damaged areas. Um, and honestly, within a few days, um, much, much, um, or many of our customers in the area had data coming back for them to, to take note and then start looking over to make decisions. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's something that you guys and, and we can, that's, that's the kind of analysis that could be enabled at this point as well. Uh, I want to talk, talk about that in a sense of you can, people listening in today and, and people interested in this, they can get a, 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 a an image, then we can run the assessment uh, and then report back to them on the, the size of the, of the issued area, the location, uh, how it's progressing over time and all of that. Um, I hope today we were able to answer questions. Please, guys, if you have any questions, do feel free uh, to, to send us uh, in the Q&A. I see a lot of them on the chat. Um, um, I see a lot of questions on the chat. Um, I'll pick one. One is asking uh, Michael about the um, about the resolution, they're talking about uh, sentinel imagery, the satellite imagery. Um, um, it captures anywhere, you know, historical imagery, three to ten meter, and then you've got uh, uh, the Turabian higher resolution imagery. And the main thing of, about these imageries, they're being captured at the right time. I think this is a case where uh, we've got science, intelligence, capability, data, which I don't like to say data, but at this point, this is the right uh, um, demonstration of when data can assist you to make a decision, can assist you to quantify and, uh, uh, and size up a problem area, and can help you move forward and monitor and get a better picture on the scale that you need to have for you to make a decision. Um, so I hope today we were able to answer uh, questions that you guys might have. Um, uh, if you have any more questions, please send them uh, in the Q and A button uh, or on the or on the chat. I've got one more question here. Um, thank you very much. He he is saying that he is um, specific to the analysis. They wanted to see specifically. Uh, what we can report on and the information that we're trying to capture. So again, what we're, what we're, what we're, uh, uh, um, the science and the basics of what we're trying to do is, is all of that imagery that's being captured relates to the plant. One band speaks about uh, the water content. One band speaks about the chlorophyll content. Um, certain combination of index highlights uh, the the spready structure of of of, uh, of the crop. Another uh, index or another score highlights the chlorophyll content, how green it is, and how still healthy and it's still it has life in it. Um, and, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at all of these, uh, create the index that makes or the score that makes the best sense to assist you to make the decision, to make a, any decision of should I go ahead and harvest or should I not harvest? Uh, should I silage? How much damage? How much rot? All of that will be highlighted, and you'll be able to pick it up. Uh, um, from the information that is captured uh, in the light and in those uh, scores. Um, I've got yeah, another I mean, question the, here. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, oh, Michael. Sorry. Um, and back to the resolution question there, uh, Travion does provide a, a single flight option as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's getting a little bit late in Iowa, but we're actually still picking up those orders. Hurricane Laura, um, I was talking to our, our manager down in the south, he is uh, picking up orders um, and our resolution is 9.7 centimeters so it's it's very close to that of a drone um, I, I did a lot of drone work um, up to a few years ago when we were five to seven centimeters so Travion provides a when we say high resolution it really is a high resolution picture back to our customers that flows of course right back into floor sets and and be able to to provide that actionable data that customers need yeah um, yeah, and, and on this slide here, you'll see the, uh, my email and uh, Michael's email. If, if there's any question that you guys, uh, uh, if there's any inquiry, anything 
you want to ask us about the imagery or about analytics, uh, timing, how we could be of service, uh, please feel free to reach out to us uh, on our emails. Um, um, I hope today's session we were able to answer questions um, that are on your mind and highlight how we can use in these extreme cases, in these extreme uh, drastic weather conditions, how uh, the science of remote sensing and data and imagery could become actionable and uh, um, are, high, are, 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 are providing the information that we need to take, and to take uh, the second steps. So, uh, Michael, any last comments, last thoughts on the situation? I don't believe so. Uh, best of luck to everyone. Um, like I said, uh, Travion is, is here to help in any way we possibly can. Please use my email. If you're in the South, you're, you're worried about Hurricane Laura, email me. I will be glad to give you your local contact's name. Um, if you're just curious about more in, into getting a flight, again, email me. I'll put you in contact with your nearest dealer and, and help you get underway to, to get started. Wonderful. And if you guys need to go back with any of the, uh, uh, any of, we've got a lot of material on our YouTube channel to learn more about uh, specific analytics uh, and, and explaining about uh, the different, uh, <clears throat> the different uh, scores and what they mean. So feel free to reach out to our resources. Feel free to reach out to me as well if I could be of any help. Best of luck. The next coming weeks are the weeks that are going to help us understand the painted picture and get ready for the next season. So it's not game over, almost game over, but we're definitely planning for how to accommodate for this next year. 